we're talking about is component transport and porous media. Well, what do I mean by component? Well, it's really any other identif any identifying particle. So it could be an element, um, a molecule. So uh, sodium chloride, for example, we could track that component as it goes along and look at the concentration. Another example would be carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide might be miscible, dissolvable in really both oil and water, but in that, in that solution that represents a component. And the concentration of that component will vary with time and space. Uh, one thing we often do in reservoirs is we do a tracer test. So what that tracer test usually is is to input one of these components and that tracer could be actually just a salt or what they um, actually have is these um, much more uh, sophisticated tracers that are radioactive and things that they can inject and they can, um, when that tracer reaches the producer well, they can track the amount of time and that gives some indication about the geology and the heterogeneity of the reservoir. Other examples of a, of a component could be um, just particles, interdispersed particles, and I've got kind of a picture or a video of that later on. So what we're doing is, is that we're interested in tracking a component, like a molecule, and how it transports with both space and time. So if you inject it into an injector well, then at some point it's going to show up in a producer well. And we're interested in in the time behavior of that, but also um, how that molecule is spread out in the, in the entire reservoir. So uh, for now what we're going to be talking about is a miscible displacement process where you, you have this component and it it's dissolves in, in another fluid. Okay. And so what you're going to have is, is that we'll just talk about one dimension again right now. So this is a 1D reservoir or 1D rock core that we might have in the laboratory. And we might inject our component at the entrance or the injection well, if you will. And there's two ways to do that. One of that is to just dump it all in in a very short period of time, right? So you just dump it in and then see what happens in the other way. The other way to do that is you have a step change. So maybe you're not injecting any salt or any tracer and then all of a sudden at some time you increase that and you have a constant injection on the other side. So you have nothing coming in and then all of a sudden you've got a lot coming in and, and that value stays constant. And the question is, is that, well, what does the exit concentration look like? Well, if the initial concentration was zero or whatever the initial concentration is, it's not surprising that initially you're going to produce whatever that initial value is because what you're injecting doesn't affect the outlet until it gets there. But once it does get there, it doesn't have this step change like you would at the entrance. It's more of a gradual increase. So it might look like something on the exit. And why is that? It's because some particles reach the exit faster than others. Okay, and that's what we call dispersion, and I'll talk more about that. When I, so when I say dispersion, we're going to talk about that, but I really, really mean is mixing. So because of mixing, what you have is that some things, the, the, the concentration spreads out and some comes out before the others. And you can have what's called longitudinal mixing or longitudinal dispersion, and that is in the direction of flow. So kind of the picture I have here is that maybe you inject at some time T, and if you look at different T's at the, say, the at a different at a certain location then the concentration sort of spread out okay things things mix and the, and the concentration spreads out the other which we'll talk about is transverse dispersion transverse that word means perpendicular right so it's in the direction perpendicular to flow and to give you an example let's say i've got a little micro model experiment here where at one inlet, I inject no tracer, so let's just say it's pure water, and in the other, I've got water with some component tracer in there. 
And if I mix them together and they're both flowing from the inlet to the outlet, you know, the, the bottom is mostly going to have the tracer component and the top part will mostly have not the tracer component. It'll be pure water. But at their interface, they're going to start to mix a little bit. And um, the, the mixing might look like this. So um, as you go further and further downstream, you have some mixing at the interface. And as time goes on, that'll be more and more mixing. So a little bit more about this, and, and here's an example of where mixing and, and component transport is important. Here's an injection well, here's a producer well. So this is a, a um, just kind of a, a schematic I found. And what we've done here is this is what's called a, a WAG, a water alternating gas. So you've got water followed by CO2, and the CO2 might mix with the water. And so you can have dispersion in this direction, or mixing in that direction, that's longitudinal, or you can have that mixing transverse as that as well. So that's why in this picture over here, I say that DL, longitudinal dispersion, and I'll define dispersion in just a few moments, has to do with the mixing in this direction of flow. The arrows going this direction mean that flow is going in that direction. But then you'd have some mixing perpendicular to that, and that will be D sub T, or the transverse dispersion. I'd like to give a, uh, another kind of a qualitative picture of what dispersion is and mixing, and, and specifically transverse dispersion. These are two rivers in Brazil, and the two rivers meet at a certain location. And you can tell by the color difference that they have different components in them, right? I mean, they're gonna have a different salt content, different, I mean, heck, a, a fish would be a component, right? But, but they're gonna be, their makeups are gonna be different. One's gonna be dirtier water than the other one, and because of that, the, uh, the, the colors are different. And right here, when they first meet, you see this nice sharp interface. But, and they're coming in, and they're going like this, and they're mixing at their interface, and if you go further downstream, it's not nearly as sharp of an interface. In fact, it's really a lot of mixing. And if you go down far enough downstream, you just have one river and the, and the concentration would be the same everywhere, right? That they would mix. So that's what's called transverse dispersion. So you have a sharp interface in the inlet, a diffuse interface downstream. So um, there are at least three mechanisms of mixing. So when you mix a different uh, components or different concentrations in there, you can have what's called molecular diffusion. Then you can have microscopic convective mixing and macroscopic permeability variation. So as I get into that, let me talk about three different transport mechanisms. By transport, we mean the movement of fluids and the movement of components. One of them is advection. Sometimes we call it convection. There's diffusion and dispersion, and they're all different. So the advection is the transport of a solute, of a particle, or an element, or a molecule, carried by fluid velocity. So I, I drew a little kind of schematic here. Let's say we had a pipe, and I drew my uh, parabolic velocity profile there, and I'm injecting, um, you know, kind of this, uh, this solute, this large concentration in a very small volume right there. And so it's a dark blue, and because of velocity, it's going to carry it with it, okay? So advection alone, what would happen is that downstream, that particle would, would, would move down. So let's say you had one particle, and let's say it was a solid particle that was dispersing, you know, and the velocity would just carry it all the way to the other side, right? And so the, kind, so the, the shape of, the, the, of this and the concentration would be the, the same, it's just at a different location downstream. Then we have something called diffusion. Okay, most of you are familiar with diffusion, and that's the transport of solute due to concentration gradients. Okay, so 
You all are familiar with, with diffusion, and they're large for gases. And you can think of a case where maybe you're, you're cooking in the kitchen, and you can smell the, the, the food, and, and initially all of the smell is in one location, right? Right by your stove. But as time goes on, that smell, that, that, that concentration migrates to other parts of the kitchen and maybe even to other parts of the room. That's, that's diffusion. It's the transport of a solute due to concentration gradients. It wants to go from high concentration to low concentration. And so I, I kind of gave a little schematic picture of that. If you've got a little particle over there and you had only diffusion, then it would start to spread out. And if you went to large enough times, it would spread out so much that it would be everywhere. I made the color lighter blue to show that it's spread out, but the concentration is lower everywhere, right? Because you can only have you got to have mass conservation. So if it's over a larger volume, then the mass per unit volume must be less. But then there's something that's called dispersion. And dispersion is a spreading and mixing of solute due to combined invection and diffusion, as well as heterogeneities. And dispersion, I, I find, is sometimes it's difficult to understand and it's sometimes difficult to differentiate from diffusion at least the first time you're learning it. The reason for that in my opinion is, is multi-fold. One of them is that the word dispersion looks a lot like the word diffusion. I mean they both start with the letter DI, they both end with the letters ON or ION. Um, so the words look alike. We often use similar variables. We'll use D for both. And then on top of that, mathematically, we treat them the same. And I'll explain that in just a moment. But they are different phenomena. They are different transport mechanisms. Diffusion is just due to this concentration gradient. Dispersion is a mixing due to the velocity. So it's, it requires advection to occur, but it's an additional transport mechanism on top of advection. And so the way... I've envisioned that as if you had your little you know, uh, concentration of, of your component and it was flowing again in our, in our pipe, then if you were to go downstream, it wouldn't just be further downstream, but it would be spread out and it'd be a lot more spread out than just diffusion because of this dispersion type thing. We'll get to more about dispersion, but let me first talk about diffusion in porous media. I think that this is much more intuitive, something that you're much more familiar with. If you think of you know, the, the, the smell of food on your stove and it's spreading through the kitchen and through the house. We often talk about molecular diffusion and I'm gonna use the variable D sub M. And that's different from dispersion, which I will use a different subscript. There is a law that indicates the amount of flux called Fick's Law. Not sure if you learned Fick's Law in your transport class or not. You may not have had time to get to it, but I'm almost certain that you did heat transfer and you learned about Fourier's Law, which was the heat flux is proportional to the temperature gradient. And I'm 100% sure that you're familiar with Darcy's Law, which says that the velocity, the, the, the volumetric flux, Q is proportional to the pressure gradient. Darcy's law, Fourier's law, and Fick's law are all analogous. And so again, this says that the flux of component J, that component J could be salt or some tracer or carbon dioxide, in phase L, the phase could be the aqueous phase, the oleic phase, or the gaseous phase, is equal to minus the diffusion coefficient times the gradient and concentration of component J in phase L with respect to X. That's in the 1D form. You can write it in multi-dimensions as well, of course. And so it's a gradient, and we already said that that's the case, right? We know that component transports by diffusion from large concentrations to small concentrations. So this is Fick's law. This flux has units of mass per area per time. Mass per area per time. In fact, anytime we talk about fluxes, it's almost always some amount per area per time. 
and we'll get to and we'll get to that in a second. Um, this molecular diffusion coefficient is usually measured experimentally, and it's published in lots of tables and books and and on the internet for different types of um, fluids and gases. All right, so gases there's the diffusion coefficients are large. Liquids, they're much less, and solids, they're very, very, very small, right? So mixing for gases can take seconds to minutes. Liquids take a little bit longer. Solids could take years or decades or, or centuries for two solids to, st to sort of diffuse into each other. They're usually measured experimentally, but um, Stokes-Einstein equation um, relates the diffusion coefficients in, in simple cases where KB is just a constant, it's called the Boltzmann constant. T is the temperature in Kelvin. Uh, mu is the viscosity of the fluid. And R is the, the radius of the particle that's diffusing. So again, gases might have a diffusion coefficient on the order of 10 to the minus three square centimeters per second. Liquids, uh, about two orders of magnitude less than that. Polymers, are, are viscous fluids in, in liquids. So they're not solids, they're at least not the polymers we're talking about, they're liquids, we use them in enhanced oil recovery. Um, but they are thicker, and we see from the Stokes-Einstein equation that the diffusion coefficient is inversely proportional to viscosity. So a more viscous fluid is gonna have a lower diffusion coefficient. And polymer fluids are, are very thick, they're almost like hair gel. And, um, and because of that, they have a lower diffusion coefficient. Now, we generally measure, we do experiments on the diffusion coefficient in the laboratory and they're usually in bulk. So you, you might just put them in, a, in two chambers or something and, and open up the chambers and let them mix together. We, of course, care about porous media, right? Rocks that are porous and, and all that. And, and that's affected by tortuosity, okay? so. The, the particles have to go through a tortuous path. So the distance that they travel is affected by that. So what I've got is this capital L is the length of your porous medium, so it's the front to the back. But this delta little l is the actual distance traveled. And the actual distance traveled is longer than that. And so uh, we'll call that the tortuosity. Uh, we can rewrite fixed law. Okay, I've included porosity in this because we've got a porous medium. And I've got an effective diffusion coefficient now, which is not the same as the molecular diffusion coefficient that I measure, but they are related. In fact, the ratio of the effective diffusion coefficient to the molecular diffusion coefficient, sometimes called the restricted diffusion coefficient, of course, that's dimensionless because these both have the same dimensions, and it's equal to one over the tortuosity squared, where the tortuosity is the, um, is again that delta L, that total distance traveled divided by the uh, distance of the porous medium. Uh, these are just kind of average values. Maybe it's something you learned in your petrophysics class, but it's approximately 1.4 for like a sphere pack. So you can think of it as a gumball machine or a, or, or maybe um, you know a bunch of glass beads in a in there, or or propant in a fracture, right? That would be a, a sphere pack. Might be a little bit larger for like a a permeable rock, like a one Darcy rock, and might be much much bigger for a low permeability rock. Okay, and if we're talking about unconventional shales, then might be even higher than that. You may have learned in your formation evaluation class that this tortuosity is related to the formation resistivity factor. Of course, phi is the porosity, F is this formation resistivity factor, and A, N, and M are empirical constants. We're not gonna really be dealing with that. If we have to use a diffusion coefficient, I would give that to you. Maybe I would give you the tortuosity so you can calculate the effective diffusion coefficient, or maybe I would just give you the effective diffusion coefficient. Diffusion, relatively speaking, is, is, is pretty small, okay? 
especially when we're talking about liquids, and, and usually we are, right? And so the amount of mixing that occurs with li liquids is, is pretty slow. It's, we already said it's about 100 times slower than gases. And if it's polymers, it's even more than that. Diffusion is, so the transport of components is slow compared to, say, advection, as well as dispersion, as we'll show in a minute. So with advection, we're flowing things in the reservoir, and it's carrying that. And generally speaking, it's much larger than diffusion. But it's not necessary, but, but there's also dispersion, and dispersion is much greater than diffusion as well. And, and to try to explain dispersion again, it's the spreading due to advection and heterogeneity, tortuosity, etc., and irreversible mixing due, due to diffusion as well. So really, the dispersion, the dispersion coefficient is going to be a combination of the diffusion coefficient, which might be small, as well as these additional uh, mixing due to advection and heterogeneity and tortuosity. To kind of give you an example, if I envision my porous media as being this um, bundle of tubes, and each tube is a different size, and we were flowing through there, the velocity would be higher in some tubes than in some of the others. And because of that, um, some particles would zip through that faster than the others, right? So where the velocity is high, the particle is going to go faster. Where the velocity is low, it's going to go slower. What does that mean? Is that some particles are going to get to the other side at different times than other particles. That's spreading. That's mixing. Okay. The tortuosity we saw was important for diffusion, but it also affects dispersion. Uh, you can also have some mixing and pores. This was kind of like the first slide I showed, but if you had a concentration of one coming in from one throat and a concentration of zero coming in another throat into a pore, then they would come in there and then they would mix, right? They're like little, little mixers. That's what, what, what pores are. You've got these tubes coming in, these throats. They would mix in there and then they would distribute out. And you could have complete mixing or if you flow fast enough, it'll only be a little bit of mixing, right? And so maybe stuff comes in and then goes out uh, quickly. So it depends on, on how well mixed and how much time you give it. And that'll, the, the amount of time, the resonance time, depends on the velocity. Even in throats, you can have some dispersion. And that was b because of the, the velocity profiles. You learned about par parabolic velocity profiles before. And a particle sort of in the center of the tube is going to move faster than one at the edges. So the molecular diffusion coefficient would be not in a porous medium. So, uh, you know, again, my analogy of, of, of the smell of your food cooking in the kitchen, or if we, let's say we had two chambers, right, and they were set, and they, they were blocked off from each other, and so there are two like chambers or two, two, um, empty rooms. Okay, let's say, let's say we had two empty rooms and they're completely closed off and they had different gases in there or different concentrations of gases. And then we opened up a door or a wall, we, we opened it and we let them mix together. That would just be regular diffusion. That includes an everyday, an everyday life. In a porous medium, we have an effective diffusion coefficient and it's affected by the tortuosity of a porous medium. So in a rock, the fluid's got to go around this tortuous path, and that affects the amount of mixing or how fast it diffuses from one location to another, and it's related to that tortuosity tau. And so because of that, this effective diffusion coefficient divided by the molecular diffusion coefficient is 1 over tau squared. So you would probably measure, or you, you, you know, lots of people have measured, molecular diffusion coefficients, that's easy to do in everyday life, and you get that value, and if you want to know what your effective diffusion coefficient is in your reservoir, you have to scale it by this tortuosity. So I hope that clarifies things a little bit. Let me make sure there's no other... Um, so, if there's more questions, let me know. I got a, a nice um, picture here. This is from a, um, this was a simulation that my P3 
PhD student did some time ago. So what this is, is it's just a 2D porous medium. So we're going to flow from left to right. We're going to inject some particles. And we're going to see how they, they move from one side to the other. So we have advection. Things are flowing. And just with straight advection, you think it would just carry things. But you're also going to have some, some dispersion and some mixing. So if I inject these particles, you can see they're all coming in. But some pores are smaller and they're faster and things like that. And because of that, you see that some of these particles kind of lead the way, right? So if I pause it right there, you can see that this particle may have been injected at the same time as this particle over here, but it's much further downstream. And so even though maybe my injected concentrations are all the same, if I look at the exit, you know, first off, it's going to be zero because there were no particles. So for the longest time, and then you have some sort of breakthrough. Remember, we talked about breakthrough times and multi-phase flow. You can have a breakthrough time here as well when the first particle arrives, and then you'll get more and more particles arrive over time. I mentioned at the beginning that we had longitudinal and transverse dispersion. So longitudinal is in the direction of flow, transverse is perpendicular to flow. The dispersion coefficient, both longitudinal and transverse, are functions of the velocity. In the absence of velocity, you don't have any dispersion. You only have diffusion. So really, the dispersion coefficient is equal to the diffusion coefficient. The more velocity you have, the more mixing you have, and the dispersion coefficients are, are greater. What I have here on the left is the longitudinal dispersion coefficient, I'm calling that d sub l, divided by d sub m. That's the molecular diffusion coefficient. So it's dimensionless. On the x-axis, I have a dimensionless number called the Peclet number. You're familiar with, with dimensionless numbers like the Reynolds number, which is a ratio of inertial to viscous effects. But this is the Peclet number, which is a ratio of advection to diffusive effects. And I've defined it as u, the velocity, times l, the length of the porous medium, divided by the molecular diffusion coefficient times the porosity. So this is the Peclet number. And the Peclet number, this is a log-log scale. So this is logarithmic. This is logarithmic. If the Peclet number is really small, if you look at this equation over here, it means the velocity is really small. So there's really not any dispersion. It's all diffusion. And that's why this is equal to the restricted diffusion coefficient, which is dm effective divided by dm. So that's going to be a little bit less than 1, and it's constant. But then when you get to a velocity that's large enough, you start to have an increase in your dispersion coefficient. And don't worry about all these, these terms here that I've got, over, I've got written over there. The important thing is this increases by several orders of magnitude. It goes from a value of less than 1 to a Peclet number over here of 10 to the 4, so 10,000. So it's increased by a factor of 10,000. And over here, clearly, okay, and any, if you've got a large enough Peclet number, clearly the, the longitudinal dispersion coefficient is much, much, much greater than the diffusion coefficient. In that case, you don't even care what the diffusion coefficient is. It, it just doesn't affect things much. Likewise, for the transverse dispersion, you have a similar type behavior. You increase the Peclet number, the transverse dispersion goes up. Transverse dispersion usually is smaller than longitudinal dispersion, maybe by a, a fa an order of magnitude, but it can still be large. Um, I, again, I don't want to go into too much detail about those things. Those are sort of details which uh, are not important. important. There have been people that have tried to 
develop equations for the longitudinal dispersion coefficient and the transverse dispersion coefficient um, normalized by the molecular diffusion coefficient. That's one of them. We won't use it. We may use this one here. So dl over dm, so this y-axis, is equal to the restricted diffusion coefficient, right, which was just dm effective over dm, plus c1 is just a fitting constant, times the Peclet number to another fitting constant, beta, where beta is like 1 to 1 1.2. Okay, so if I look at this equation, if Peclet number is small, if it's close to zero, then this term is negligible, and then dl over dm is just dr, which is dm effective over dm. So that means that the dispersion of coefficient is just equal to the effective diffusion coefficient. That's if the velocity is super, super low, like maybe like non-existent, right? There's no flow, maybe the wells are shut in or something. But if the Peclet number is large, then this term dominates over this one. You can almost neglect that, and you can, you can calculate that. So um, let's do a little bit of derivations of, of a balance. So I'll come over here. Do a mass balance of component J. Now I want to remind you that there is a big difference between a component and a phase. Right? So a phase is like your water phase, your aqueous phase, or your oleic phase, or your gaseous phase. Right? They're they're, they're separated. Um, they have interfaces between them. Each of those phases can have lots of different components. Okay, so think about the, the oil phase, the oleic phase. The oleic phase can have methane, that's a component, ethane, propane, butane, hydrogen sulfide. Okay, those are all components. In fact, the oleic phase can really have tens of thousands of components. The aqueous phase could have, well, water, H2O is a component, but it, and it's like 99 plus percent of the aqueous phase. But then you can have some other components. Okay, these the aqueous phases almost always have salts in them, so sodium chloride. Could have some minerals in there. Could have CO2 dissolved in there. By the way, you can have components that occur in multiple phases. Think about methane. Methane is going to be dissolved in your oleic phase, but it'll also be in the gaseous phase. So I'm going to call J the component. Okay, it's just a, you know, J could, you could have multiple components, but J refers to a specific component. And um, if I talk about phases, I'll call it L. So L could be. W for the aqueous phase, O for the oleic phase, or G for the gaseous phase. And again, your component J could be in multiple phases. What we're going to do is we're going to write a, a mass balance. We're going to do it in 1D. We could do it in multiple dimensions, but I think 1D is hard enough for now. And let's say you're injecting your component J in. Right, and then you know you're going to have something come out as well. Maybe you had no component originally in there. Let's say it's it's just pure water or something, and then you inject you inject water with a component J in it. Okay, um, so it's going to change with location and time, and it doesn't have to be that. You could have some in there, and you inject more or inject less or something like that, but. We're injecting this over here. We're going to do our mass balance as we've done in the past. This is three dimensions. Maybe I can draw it like... 
Okay, this is some location x. This is some location x plus delta x. This is the area A. So this distance is delta x, so the volume is delta x times a. We've seen that before. We did a mass balance earlier in the semester, I think, or in Reservoir 1. And we're going to write our mass balance on this control volume, on this little box here. Okay. So what do we know? Anytime we do a balance, whether it be a mass balance, a momentum balance, or a, an energy balance, it's always the same. It's whatever goes in to that control volume minus whatever goes out is equal to what is accumulated. So it's possible, in fact probable, that the amount that goes in is not the same as the amount that goes out, which means that you've got some accumulation or possibly deaccumulation of your component with time. So what goes in is going to be some sort of mass flux. So it's going to be the flux of component J at location X, or in the X direction, I should say. And it, we're only going in the X direction. I probably could have dropped that sub, first subscript X because we're only in the X direction, but uh, might as well be complete about it. So remember I said flux N is an amount per area per time, or in our case a mass per area per time, and this is a mass balance. So if it's a mass per area per time, we want to multiply by the area A times the time delta T, and this is how much goes in at location X. We could also have NJ X downstream at x plus delta x, so that's what's coming out right at this location, times a delta t. You could have some component that's injected or produced, that's injected into your system or produced out. There's a few mechanisms for that. The most obvious is that you could have a well where you were injecting that at that location. Another is that you could have some sort of reaction that occurs that turns your component J into a different component. I'm going to call this some sort of generation or consumption term. And this is a mass per unit volume per time times my volume, I'll call it delta V, times my delta T. So this is my in, this is my out, this is my generation or generation consumption term. And then we're going to have our, our accumulation term. Okay? And so we want what we want is the amount of mass, you know, these are all have units of pounds or kilograms, right? Pounds, pounds, pounds. So what we want is to see how much mass of J we have now versus how much we'll have at some time in the future delta T. So the amount we have now is the concentration, the mass per unit volume of J. That would I'm going to call that J, the W. Okay, so this is mass per unit volume of J times the volume. This is at the future time, T plus delta T, minus the mass per unit volume times delta V at the current time, T. So this is the accumulation term. where, again, Nj is equal to the flux component J, which has got units of mass per area per time, and Wj is equal to a concentration of J, which is the mass, I should put mass of J, mass of J per volume. Okay. 
A is the area, delta T is the time, delta V is the volume. This M tilde is just a source term. It's a mass per volume per time that's injected. Don't worry too much about it, so I'll just put MJ is a source term of J, and it's got mass per volume per time. Okay, and if you check this, then every one of these terms should have units of mass, pounds or kilograms, something like that. Okay, so this is our balance written on this control volume up here. Okay, and what we'll have to do is we'll have to take the limit as delta t and delta x go to zero, so a very small control volume and a very small delta time, and this will turn this algebraic equation into a differential equation. We'll, so we'll describe our component concentration as a function of space, that's x, and time t.